Throughout history, as seen below, criminals and lawbreakers have sometimes been driven by altruistic motives. Take, for example, the teenage criminal forger who put his talents during the Second World War to helping the resistance and saving thousands from German clutches. Sometimes they are driven by a mix of good and bad, such as the art forger who made millions, but also conned Nazi bigwigs while at it. Most of the time, though, they're driven by greed or plain evil. Following are twenty fascinating things about some of the good, the bad, and the ugly of lawbreakers from history. Number twenty, end of the road for a triple traitor. As Allied armies neared Paris in 1944, Harold Kohl fled in a Gestapo uniform. In June 1945, he turned up in southern Germany, claiming to be a British undercover agent, and offered his services to the American occupation forces. Triple crossing, he turned against the Nazis. Hunting and flushing them out of hiding, and murdering at least one of them. The British discovered Cole's whereabouts and arrested him, but he escaped the prison where he was awaiting court martial and headed to France. French police received a tip off that he was hiding in a central Paris apartment, and on January 8, 1946, they crept up a staircase to seize him. Their heavy tread gave them away. However, he met them at the doorway, pistol in hand. In the ensuing shootout, Cole was struck multiple time and bled to death. Number 19, the gruesome grave digger. In 1971, West German police were disturbed when they began receiving reports that somebody was robbing graves, exhuming bodies from cemeteries, and gnawing on them. The female corpses were sexually abused as well. In May 1972, a morgue attendant came across somebody kissing a cadaver. When he tried to stop him, the culprit pulled out a pistol and fired, but missed. The morgue worker gave police a description of the assailant, and they threw a dragnet. It eventually caught Kuno Hoffman, a deaf and mute laborer who had lost the powers of speech and hearing after his alcoholic father beat him in childhood. Hoffman had a rap sheet, including nine years in prison for theft. When the cops interrogated him, he readily confessed to a bizarre crime spree. Number eighteen, macabre self-improvement. While behind bars, Kuno Hoffman had developed an obsession with self-improvement via occult sciences. He read extensively on satanic rituals. Witchcraft, dark magic, and especially on vampirism and necrophilia, his occult readings led him to believe that he could become handsome and popular by performing dark magic rituals with corpses. Hence, the grave robbing. On at least 35 occasions, Hoffman snuck into graveyards or mortuaries and even managed to get copies of the keys to a local cemetery. He wanted the recently dead, so chose his victims from recent death notices in newspapers. He would try to get them in the morgue, but if he could not. He would wait until they were buried, then dig up their graves. Once he secured a corpse, Hoffman would perform rituals that involved stabbing and slashing it, cutting off the head on occasion, and drinking the blood. Other times, he would chew on the corpse, and if it was of a female he found attractive, he would have sex with it. Number seventeen, the need for ever fresher corpses. When Kuno Hoffman's grave robbing and sexual molestation of corpses failed to make him handsome and popular, he reasoned it was because the corpses were not fresh enough. So he decided to get the freshest possible corpses by killing people. Hoffman's first victims were lovers in a car. After shooting them dead, he drank the blood from their wounds. Then he had sex with the girl's corpse, as he told police. He liked her more than the graveyard corpses. He killed another victim, and would have gone on killing more. If his spree had not been cut short by his arrest, Hoffman was deemed insane and ordered confined in a mental asylum for the rest of his life. Number sixteen, the kingpin who laid the foundations of the modern mafia, Salvatore Maranzano, born eighteen eighty six, died nineteen thirty one, of Castellammare, Sicily, was a powerful mafiosi who emigrated to the U.S. and laid the foundations of the modern American mafia. He founded what became the Banana Crime Family. And instigated the Castellamaris War against Joe the Boss Masseria for control of New York's criminal world. Winning that war, Maranzano declared himself capo di tutti capi, or boss of all bosses. The last such occurrence in the American mafia's history. Maranzano had initially studied to become a priest before turning to crime, immigrating to America soon after the First World War. He started a legitimate real estate business as a front for his criminal activities, such as bootlegging, narcotics. Gambling and prostitution. Maranzano was a huge fan of Julius Caesar, whom he sought to emulate, and had a habit of lecturing his less educated American mafia peers about the Roman dictator, earning him the nickname Little Caesar. It was not meant as a compliment. Number fifteen, trouble shipped over from Sicily. 
years of mounting tensions between the New York City criminal organizations of Salvatore Maranzano and Joe Masseria finally came to a head, the result was a bloody struggle for control of the Italian-American Mafia, waged from February 1930 to April 1931, that came to be known as the Castellameris War. Joe Masseria had been the dominant Mafia figure in the 1920s, running a powerful crime family whose ranks included future mob bosses such as Lucky Luciano, Vito Genovese, and Frank Costello. However, a Don Vito Ferro, a Mafia chieftain from Castellamare, Sicily, decided to reach out and wrest control of the American Mafia. So he sent Salvatore Maranzano to establish the rival Castellamare's faction, whose ranks included future mob bosses such as Joe Profasi, Joe Bonanno, and Stefano Magadino. Number 14. The Castellamaris War In 1928 the Maseria and Maranzano factions started hijacking each other's alcohol trucks and encroaching on and disrupting rival bootlegging operations. Fighting erupted in February 1930, when Maseria ordered the killing of a Castellamaris Detroit racketeer. The Castellamaris retaliated a few months later by murdering a key Maseria enforcer in Harlem. A few weeks later, they got a Maseria ally whom he had earlier betrayed, the Reina family, to switch sides killing a key Masseria loyalist on their way out Masseria responded in October, 1930, by sending one of his key lieutenants, Alfred Minio, to kill a key Castellamarese ally, Joe Aiello in Chicago. In November, Minio and another key Masseria henchman were murdered, and Minio's successor defected to Maranzano, the tide then swiftly turned, with other Masseria allies defecting and switching to the Castellamarese, with his ship clearly sinking Masseria's remaining key henchman, led by Lucky Luciano, approached Maranzano, offering to defect and seal the deal by murdering Masseria. On April 15, 1931, Masseria was duly murdered. Number 13. A Short-Lived Victory On the surface, the Castellamaris War had been a power struggle between mob bosses Joe Masseria and Salvatore Maranzano, an underlying current, however, was a generational struggle of their younger underlings, who grew up American, against the rival bosses and their entire generation of leadership. Derided as mustache peats, the old-timers were insular, set in their old-world ways, and unwilling or unable to adapt to American realities. Having won, Maranzano reorganized the Italian-American Mafia, establishing the basic structure that survives to this day, each family would henceforth have a boss and underboss, and beneath them would be captains, or Kapoor regimes in command of soldiers, above them all Maranzano declared himself boss of all bosses however. Maranzano, an egomaniac with delusions of grandeur who fancied himself a Julius Caesar of the criminal world, did not enjoy his victory for long, five months after declaring himself capo di tutti capi, Lucky Luciano had him murdered, he then he abolished the boss of all bosses title, and set up a collective mafia leadership council, the commission, to avoid future gang wars. Number 12. History's Most Successful Pirate Ching Shi, also known as Madame Ching, born 1775, died 1844, was a Chinese pirate who terrorized the South China in the early 19th century. She was arguably history's most successful pirate, commanding tens of thousands of outlaws, despite challenging the British Empire, the Portuguese Empire, as well as the Chinese Qing Dynasty. She survived to retire from piracy and into a peaceful life. She was a former prostitute who married a powerful pirate named Cheng, and participated fully in his piratical activities. Upon his death she inherited his outlaw realm, and became known as Ching Shi, Chinese for Cheng's widow. However, she was not just a widow who lucked into a huge inheritance. Her own legacy as a pirate far exceeded that of her deceased husband. Number 11. Choosing the Right Subordinates Madam Ching's success owed much to her talent at choosing capable subordinates, the most formidable of them was Cheung Po Tsai, whose name translates as Cheung Po the Kid. He was a poor fisherman's son who was kidnapped at age 15 by Madame Ching and her husband, and pressed into their cruise. The teenager exhibited a precocious talent for the new career suddenly thrust upon him, and rose swiftly through the ranks. Before long, Cheung had become the pirate couple's favorite protege and subordinate, and ended up getting adopted by them after Cheng's untimely death by drowning. Madame Ching took over his pirate fleet and she selected Cheung as her right-hand man. The pirate queen and her adoptive son soon developed an incestuous affair, and eventually married. Number 10. An Outlaw's Greatest Coup, Dying Peacefully in Bed 
Madam Ching's scale of piratical operations far exceeded anything seen in the Caribbean during the Golden Age of Piracy. At the height of her power, she controlled over 300 ships and commanded up to 80,000 outlaws, to put that in perspective. Blackbeard, the Age of Piracy's most notorious villain, commanded no more than four ships and 300 men. With her massive armada, Madam Ching effectively controlled and held for ransom the shipping lanes around southern China, her widespread depredations and the resultant outcry finally compelled the Chinese authorities to launch a massive campaign to eradicate piracy and restore order. In 1810, seeing the writing on the wall and deciding that discretion was the better part of valor, she accepted a pardon. Madam Ching abandoned piracy and returned to her hometown, where she opened a gambling house and brothel. She died peacefully in bed in 1844, surrounded by her family. Number 9. Harlem's Greatest Crime Boss Harlem's most feared criminal kingpin from 1930 until his death in 1968 was Ellsworth Bumpy Johnson. Born in South Carolina in 1905, he got his nickname from a bump in the back of his head. When he was 10, Bumpy's older brother killed a white man, and fled to the north to escape a lynch mob. Bumpy's temper and refusal to abide by the day's racial codes, particularly the deference to white's part, made his parents fear that he would end up killing somebody or get lynched, so at age 14, he was sent to live with a sister in Harlem. Number 8. Working for Harlem's Crime Queen? In Harlem, Bumpy Johnson joined a protection racket that shook down stores. He got his big break when he was hired as a leg breaker by Madame St. Clair, Harlem's biggest bookmaker and reigning crime queen. He eventually became a numbers runner, then a bookmaker. When mobster Dutch Schultz attempted to take over St. Clair's bookmaking in the early 1930s, Bumpy Johnson was her point man in a gang war that lasted until Schultz's assassination, on mob boss Lucky Luciano's orders in 1935. After Schultz's demise, Bumpy negotiated a deal with Lucky Luciano in the 1930s, by which Harlem bookmakers retained their independence in exchange for a cut to the mafia, it was the first time a black man had cut such a deal with the Italian mob, and made Bumpy a respected and somewhat heroic figure in the neighborhood. Thereafter, he was the main associate of the Luciano Mafia crime family in Harlem, Number 7. Feared and Revered Bumpy Johnson was feared and revered in Harlem for decades. He became friends with famous figures such as Cab Calloway, Billie Holiday, Sugar Ray Robinson, and Lena Horne. His activities were reported in the celebrity sections of magazines such as Jet. He was also Harlem's criminal kingpin, whose approval every hood needed in order to operate in that part of town. He did nine years in Alcatraz from 1954 to 1963 and was greeted with a parade upon his return. Yet, despite his flashy fashion, his poetic pretensions, and ostentatious distribution of turkeys to the poor on Thanksgiving, he never joined the pantheon of famous American villains, this, notwithstanding that the stock gangster boss character in every exploitation film, starting with Bumpy Jonas in Shaft, is modeled on him, or that the entire gangster rap genre is essentially a homage to Bumpy Johnson. Number 6 deadlier than Al Capone? Bumpy Johnson almost certainly murdered and ordered the murder of more people than, for example, John Gotti, Jesse James, Billy the Kid, and perhaps even Al Capone. He certainly ran his criminal empire for far longer than any of them ran theirs. The fact that he was black, and so were most of his victims, is a factor in explaining why he is not as famous as other iconic American criminals. His exploits did not resonate far beyond Harlem. Another factor is that there was something cold and reptilian about Bumpy. Most famous criminals were hot and passionate. Bumpy Johnson, by contrast, quietly made his victims disappear, like Al Capone's successor Frank Nitti, another crime boss who ran his criminal kingdom for decades, and garnered relatively little public attention. Number 5. Maintaining Order Bumpy Johnson died of a heart attack in a Harlem restaurant, clutching his chest and keeling over around 2 a.m. on the morning of July 7, 1968. His death was dramatized in the movie American Gangster, which depicted him expiring in the arms of his surrogate son and successor, Frank Lucas, who would revolutionize New York's drug trade. Bumpy Johnson had dominated the Harlem crime scene for decades, maintaining some measure of order on the street. After his death, various contenders scrambled to fill his shoes, their competition led to a marked increase in violence and chaos on the streets. Number 4. From philanthropist and socialite to pirate At the close of the 17th century, 
one of New York City's leading citizens was the Scotsman William Kidd, circa 1645 to 1701, a prominent philanthropist and socialite. Kidd became personal friends with at least three New York governors. Among his philanthropic activities was the lead role he played in building NYC's now historic Trinity Church. There was thus little in Kidd's background to indicate that he would end up swinging from the gallows executed as the notorious pirate, Captain Kidd. Kidd's first sea command was as a privateer, commissioned in 1689 by the governor of Nevis to fight the French. He was granted what were known as letters of marque, authorizing him to prey on French vessels for the duration of hostilities between Britain and France. Later, he was issued additional letters of marque by the governors of New York and the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Number 3. A Failed Pirate Hunter In 1695, William Kidd's mission was expanded, he was presented with a letter of marque signed by King William III, giving him a roving commission to attack pirates in the Indian Ocean thus making him a sort of legal criminal. The voyage started inauspiciously, sailing out of London in a newly equipped ship. The 34-gun and 150-man crew adventure galley Kidd offended a Royal Navy captain by failing to salute his warship. The captain retaliated by stopping the adventure galley and seizing half of its crew to press into the Royal Navy. Crossing the Atlantic shorthanded, Kidd made it to New York, where he replenished his crew with whatever out-of-work seafarers he could find. Most of them were hardened criminals and former pirates. Sailing into the Indian Ocean, a third of Kidd's crew died of cholera by the time they reached the Comoros Islands. To top it off, he was unable to find any of the pirates he had been sent to hunt down. Number 2. Turning to Piracy The Enterprise was a failure, and Captain Kidd's crew, getting antsy, urged him to attack some passing vessels in order to make the voyage worth their time, when Kidd declined, his men threatened mutiny, under pressure, he gave in, and reluctantly started attacking ships not covered by his privateering letters. By 1698, he had abandoned reluctance and any pretense of privateering, and turned full pirate and criminal that year, he sealed his fate when he attacked a British East India Company ship, the powerful company exerted its influence in London, and Kidd was declared a pirate and criminal. Number 1. His fame preceded him. Unbeknownst to Captain Kidd, by the time he returned to the American colonies, his fame, or infamy, had preceded him, and his public image had been transformed into that of a notorious criminal pirate. During his absence, attitudes towards piracy had changed from the wink, wink, nudge, nudge, which had been the norm when he began his voyage, now, crackdown was in the air, and the authorities were eager to make an example of somebody. Kidd was thus extremely unlucky to return when he did, he was arrested as soon as he arrived in Boston, and he was sent in chains across the Atlantic for prosecution in London, there, word of his previous connections with government elites caused a scandal, and the powerful supporters whom he had expected to defend him abandoned Kidd in droves, he was swiftly tried and convicted, and on May 23, 1701, he was hanged, his corpse was then left to rot in a cage on the Thames for all to see.